I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder You can hear my presence roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost to hold on me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder you can hear my presence roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Sing a little louder 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 I'm gonna sing I'm gonna sing middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my presence roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah Hallelujah. I raise a 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 hallelujah. <laughs> Father in heaven, we come before you this evening, and I just pray that your Holy Spirit just moves afresh amongst us here in this sanctuary, Lord. And for those who are watching either the live stream or listening on the radio, I just pray that your Holy Spirit just speaks to each one of us. We just need more of you and less of us. And just pray that you meet us here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, please do. Uh, 
at your name the mountain shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh we love to shout your name O oh Lord at your name the morning breaks in glory At your name Creation sings your story At your name The angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out Lord of all the earth we Shout your name, shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord Lord of all the earth Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you No one like our God, we will sing, we will sing There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you no one like our God, we will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord <laughs> Praise God I see the Lord seated on the throne Exalted and the train of his robe Fills the temple with glory And the whole earth is filled the whole earth is filled And the whole earth is filled With His glory I see the Lord I see the Lord Seated on the throne Exalted in the train of His robe Fills a temple with glory And the whole earth is filled And the whole earth is filled And the whole earth is filled With His glory Holy
holy, holy you are holy, holy is the Lord of all. See the Lord seated on the throne, exalted in the train of his robe, fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled. And the whole earth is filled with His glory. Holy, 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 holy is the There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus is overcome And the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrows, no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings Before my God Fall on my knees and rise I will rise There's a day that's drawing near When this darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes Jesus is overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise when He calls my name no more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings Before my God Fall on my knees and rise I will rise And I hear the voice of many angels sing Worthy is the Lamb And I hear the cry of every longing heart Worthy is the Lamb 
And I hear the voice of many angels sing Worthy is the Lamb And I hear the cry of every longing heart Worthy is the Lamb Worthy is the Lamb You are worthy is the Lamb And I will rise when He calls my name No more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings Before my God fall on my knees and rise and rise and rise find that I'm safe and warm in your loving arms I find that I'm safe and warm in your loving arms you see me you know me you love me through and through you see me you know me, you love me through and through. Father in heaven, you always see us and you know us and yet you still love us. We thank you just for your mercy and your grace and your love. 
for us. We thank you for your gift of your spirit to come and to comfort us when we are just beaten down, when the world's got the better of us, when we have taken our eyes off of you. Lord, your spirit comes and regenerates us, comforts, encourages. And I thank you for your spirit that when we start going astray, that your spirit just draws us back to you because of your goodness for us. And Father in heaven, Abba, Father, we thank you that you willingly gave up your son, Jesus and Jesus, that you left your throne, that you came down here. And you lived a perfect life, even though you were tempted in everything that we, we were tempted in. And because of faith and obedience and love, you went to the cross for us. We humbly and reverence thank you for that. And we praise you in your name that we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So last week we started the survey through the Old Testament scripture, right? And, and so we went through the book of Genesis or attempted to, and as you'll recall, Genesis is the book of beginnings, right? And so as we were going through it, um, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of information, a lot of characters there. And really, this week, the book of Exodus is a continuation of that. It's really could almost be all one book. You know, if you look at the first word in Exodus, it says now. And really, that could also be translated and, you know, just a continuation on of what was happening uh, at the end of Genesis. And we'll get into it a little bit more in a minute, but Exodus means exit, right? It was Israel exiting from their bondage in, uh, in Egypt, and we'll see some of that chronicled throughout Exodus, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But uh, just as Genesis was the book of beginnings, there's a lot of beginnings here in Exodus uh, that are recorded by Moses. And first of all, you know, we see the birth of the nation of Israel is one of them. We see the beginning of Israel's Passover. We see the beginning of the tabernacle. You know, there's several, about a quarter of the book talks about, um, you know, the tabernacle. And, and in fact, there's 11 chap chapters in Exodus that are devoted to instruction about the tabernacles and and all of the ordinances and stuff related to it. So there's a, there's a lot of information in here regarding the tabernacles, and if you would like specifics on it, read it for yourself, because we're not going to get into all of them in a survey, but just know that it's all there. You know, we, we see the beginning of the law, highlighted by the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And, uh, you know, Exodus records the first praise song in the Bible. And the interesting thing about it, uh, and I found this interesting, is it's referred to the praise song, the uh, you know the uh, it's called the song of Moses. It's also referred to in Revelation chapter 15 that those who are in heaven at the point in Revelation chapter 15 will be singing it. So as we have the words here. On, uh, up for the praise songs we have, we have recorded for us in Exodus 15 a praise song that we're going to be singing in heaven. I thought that was kind of cool. So, uh, you know, because in Revelation chapter 15, it says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, uh, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. You know, we'll be in heaven singing this song. So I thought that was kind of neat, you know. That's, like I said, we have the lyrics up here. God gave us the lyrics in Exodus for one of the songs, one of the praise songs we'll be singing there. So as I was saying, as we get into the book of Exodus, and as it really chronicles uh, the first part of Moses' life, 
uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things, there's a lot of interesting facts that we'll be able to kind of develop as really Moses is the central kind of character throughout the book of um, Exodus, but we see so much of God and we see so much of God's characteristics um, that still apply to this day. How God was so faithful uh, to, to his promises, he was so faithful to his people throughout the book of Exodus, how, how God led uh, the nation, you know, the Hebrews out of Egypt, out of their bondage, just as he leads us and delivers us out of our, you know, out of our Egypt, out of our, uh, you know, sin and delivers us. It's the same thing because, you know, that's kind of the central theme here in the book of Exodus, it's deliverance, the deliverance of the nation of Israel out of bondage. Uh, you know, and God, uh, throughout the years, for the nation of Israel, they were, uh, God promised them that it would happen, and God always is faithful uh, to follow through what he promises us, doesn't he? We see it throughout Scripture, because in the book of Genesis, he gives a couple of uh, promises to the nation, in Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, it says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge afterwards. They shall come out with great possessions." You know, this is a prophecy. He's telling them this is going to happen, right? And then in Genesis 46, verses 3 and 4, it says, So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hands on your eyes. You know, he's given these prophecies or, you know, these promises saying, you know, don't be afraid. I'm in control. Don't be afraid. I will deliver you. And you know what? He's telling us the same thing today, isn't he? Don't be afraid. What do you have to be afraid of? I'm in control. You know, if you truly believe that, then what do you have to fear? You know, we don't have to fear you know, whatever the case may be, government or the economy or you name it, because God is in control. God, if God was in control of the Hebrews, he was in, just as he's in control of us now, isn't he? So if they don't have to be afraid of their Egypt. We don't have to be afraid of ours. You know, it's the same thing. God is in control. He wasn't in control back then when, you know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. No, he, he was still in control. And so we see that all throughout Scripture, just the faithfulness of God. And we see it in, in uh, Exodus here in chapter 6, it says, in verses 6 to 8, it says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give to you as a heritage, I am the Lord. You know, I love that, and it's the same promises that he's giving here he gives to us, doesn't he? You know, that he will rescue us from our bondage, that he'll rescue us with an outstretched arm, that he is faithful. You know, that is the, the same God that did this for the Hebrews, uh, you know, delivering them from the bondage of Egypt. He will deliver us from our bondage too. It's the same God. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't change. He's immutable. And we see it in the New Testament, and I quote this a lot when the U-turn guys graduate, uh, Philippians 1.6, saying, Being confident of this very, very thing, that he, has, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, God is faithful. He's always faithful, and he will complete the work he's begun in us. God doesn't get bored with us and say, eh, you know, I was doing a thing, but I got bored and I'm not going to do it anymore. No, God is faithful. God is always faithful and always will be faithful, and he will always see us through. He will always deliver us 
from that bondage, won't he? He'll always deliver us from those things that ail us. He will deliver us from and take us out of those places that he doesn't want us. You know, God is faithful. Just as, you know, we see that characteristic of him there. And then uh, as it continues on, in chapter 2, it chronicles uh, the birth of Moses. And I love the birth of Moses because, once again, it just shows how God works. It just shows uh, how God is in control of everything. And, and you know, what we see in chapter 2 of Moses is, um, well, actually, we'll back up a little bit to chapter 1 to kind of get the, the story behind chapter 2. So in chapter 1, God's promises, of course, are fulfilled. And we see in verse 7, it says, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. You know, God did what he promised to do in Genesis, you know, that they would be fruitful, that they would multiply, that they would become a great nation like we had read from Genesis 15 and Genesis 46. Well, it, by the time Exodus 1 rolls around, it's already the case. But what happens is, as we see in verse 8, that there's a new king, one that's not, uh, you know, no longer has that covenant with the nation of Israel, uh, you know, who was, um, who allowed Israel to come in and, and be it. This new king, he is, you know, he's kind of, in, he's intimidated because God has blessed the nation of Israel so much. And it says in verse eight, it says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. So go up out of the land. So he says, you know what? The Israelites have become too powerful. You know, and if they, if they team up with our enemies... Uh, we'll be in trouble here. So let's go up and deal shrewdly with them. Let's, you know, let's, uh, um, let's, let's make sure we diminish their power or their numbers and all of this. So we see in verse 16, it says, speaking of, uh, well, we'll go to verse 15. In verse 15, it says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, and whom the name of one was Shiprah, and the name of the other was Puah. And he said, uh, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and you see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then, you shall, uh, then she shall live. You know, he's saying, I want all the males dead. Now, why would he want all the males dead? Because, you know, typically it's the males who wage war, right? It's the males who fight. So he's saying, I don't mind if the Hebrew women are allowed to live. Um, they make good maidservants, slaves, whatever. And so they don't pose a risk for us. So that's okay if they live, but kill all the male sons. But, uh, you know, the thing about it and the thing I love about this is God's will is always going to be done. And we see a perfect example of that in chapter 2, because God had a plan and a purpose for Moses, didn't he? He had a, a big plan and a purpose. He was going to use Moses to, uh, as the one uh, to lead the nation of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. And I don't care who you are or how powerful you are, when God has purposed something, regardless of what you do, uh, it's not going to work. You know, you see it all throughout history, and we see that here in chapter 2. So, you know, um, the thing that I love is it continues on in these verses where, you know, the king told them that, uh, you know, he needed to kill all of the, uh, all the sons. In verse 18, it says, So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, or I'm sorry, verse 17, it says, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. You know, there's the thing, too. It doesn't matter who's in authority or who's in power or the government or whatever. God's in control. And we have to obey God rather than man. And, you know, back in 
this time frame, you know, the pharaohs, the kings, they were like God to, uh, to the Egyptian culture. In fact, not like God, they were a God, weren't they? But these midwives were saying, you know, I fear the true and living God. I don't really care what you say. I'm not going to obey it because I know it goes against what the, the true and living God has to say. You can tell me what you want and I'll suffer the consequences for it. But I fear the real God, not you. And, and you know, we see that uh, not only here in the Old Testament, and there's many examples in the Old Testament, but we also see it in the, the New Testament where Jesus teaches about it. And this is in, from Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 through 31. It says, Jesus speaking says, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And verse 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the, your father's will? But the very hairs of your hair, head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. You know, Moses... You know, what's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, don't worry about the physical. You know, your true being, who you really are, is spiritual. You know, fear more about losing your soul in hell than, than you know, losing your physical life here. Because this is just for a short period of time anyways, right? This isn't our home. We're just passing through here. Don't focus on the here and now as much. Be more heavenly minded. We got to make sure that, uh, you know, we have the correct priorities because our priorities should be more about the kingdom of God than the than our personal kingdom here on earth, right? And that's what he's saying. You know, we need to have more more fear and reverence of God than we do of man. Uh, and it's simply that, you know, and so as we see God's will unfolding here in chapter two with Moses, God is going to protect his children. God's going to protect. If God is, you know, has a plan and a purpose, it's going to happen that way. And we see it in, in chapter two here with the birth of Moses. And so as it goes on in, in chapter 2, verse 2, it says, So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes from him and daubed it with asphalt and pitch and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood far off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maiden walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw, to, uh, saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman? that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away, nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. I love this story. So what we see here, right, is first of all, the king comes along and says, All the male child children have to be killed. Well, uh, Moses' mom hides him for three months until he gets too big or whatever that she can no longer conceal him. So she builds a little ark, sends him down the river, just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter is bathing in the river, sees it, takes the baby, right? Has compassion for it. Says, okay, I need somebody to nurse this baby. Oh, by the way, it just happens to be Moses' mom. So now, not only is Moses saved, not only is Moses uh, protected, but Moses' mom is nursing and taking care of the baby and being paid for it. That's the kind of stuff God does, right? That, that is the kind of work that God does. Because like I said, regardless of, of what anybody says, what the government says, God's will is going to be done. And he's going to do it in his way. And sometimes he's going to do it like this in miraculous ways. You know, a lot of people would try to uh, say, oh, it's just, 
you know, by luck, all this happened. No, this wasn't luck. This was preordained by God. He knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, God, uh, nothing's too hard for God. God, yesterday, uh, you know, is the same as tomorrow, as as eternity is to God. He's outside of the time frame. So he knew all this was going to happen, and it was in his perfect timing, wasn't it? But I love this story. You know, it just shows another characteristic of God here. And so, you know, as we think about that, as children of God, we don't have to worry about the future, do we? We don't have to worry, because if we truly are children of God, and we believe God's in control, then we should have comfort and rest in that, right? We don't have to be anxious about, well, what's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? Well, if God's in control, He's in control, right? You know, uh, as it says in the New Testament, you know, I kind of... um, Go back and forth in the New Testament. Uh, For that reason, it says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such a place and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor uh, that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, he shall live and do this or do that. Right? You know, if God wills, that's the key. You know, not, well, I want to do this and this and this and hope God will permit it or I can get away with it. No, you know, it's it's like, you know what, God's in control and if He wills, if I can stay in His perfect will, then, you know what, that's what I want for my life. It's it's His will. I want, that's what I want, right? And so... That's what, we're, that's what we see here is God's divine providence through these first nine verses of chapter 2. But, you know, even, even someone who's called and someone who's anointed by God, you know what, they can step outside of God's will and blow their witness, can't they? We've seen it many times. I could give you uh, a bunch of examples of modern times, but we'll, since we're in the book of Exodus, let's look at... Chapter 2, verse 11 here. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at the burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, uh, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and looked that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So, you know, I like the way it describes that. You know, it's like he looked this way and he looked that way. Uh, you know, and, and then killed the Egyptian and, and buried him in the sand. I like what um, Pastor Chuck Smith has to say about this. It says, Moses looked this way and that way, but he didn't look up. He was impetuous and hot-tempered when he killed the Egyptian. God did ordain Moses, but Moses had acted in the power of his flesh. Oh, how important that any service we offer to God be done in the power, anointing, and guiding of the Spirit. Although we have a heart to serve God, our efforts are futile if we're doing it in the energy of our flesh, rather than waiting upon the Lord and being led by the Spirit. You know, it's so true, and and I like the way he put it, you know, Moses looked this way and he looked that way, but he didn't look up. You know, and it's it's so true, you know, when we're doing things on on our own terms and in our own flesh, and we're not, um, you know, looking up to God to see what His will is, we get in trouble and we blow our witness. And let's see, as this story unfolds, what happens. And it says in verse 13, And when he went out a second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Right? So he said, who are you to judge anybody? You're the guy who killed and buried the Egyptian. Are you going to do that to me? I mean, what moral authority do you have to, you know, speak anything at this point? I saw you smoke an Egyptian and bury him in the sand. Who are you? You know, it's, it's true. And we have to be careful. You know, even when we... When we're serving God and we're doing that, we have to make sure we're doing it 
in the spirit and not in the flesh. Like, like um, Pastor Chuck said, we have to look up. We have to constantly make sure that our motives are right, that our motives are um, you know, what, uh, aligned with what God would have us do. Otherwise, it becomes real easy for us to lose our witness with people, right? You know, like, who are you to tell me what I should do when you're doing X, Y, and Z? Or, you know, I saw you... Um, you know, blow up at your wife or whatever the case may be, you know, we have to really be careful about that, don't we? But the one thing, once again, uh, regardless of what we've done in our past, God will deliver us, won't he? And God can still use us and God can still call us. You know, we see a man here in Moses who was a murderer, right? But yet... That's in chapter 2, yet in chapter 3, you know, we see the burning bush, you know, where God is calling him. And in uh, chapter 3, verse 2, it says, uh, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So we looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. You know, um, Think about how that must have been. Okay, so you have Moses. He, he murdered uh, you know, an Egyptian. He was found out. So if we would have kept reading in, in chapter 2, verse 15, it says he fleed to the land of Midian, right? So now he's a sheep herder, right? He went from being prince of Egypt to a sheep herder. Or, and he's out there tending his flock, and all of a sudden he comes and has this burning bush experience where God is meeting him there in the desert. You know, the same thing God does for us. He meets us in our desert, doesn't he? He meets us in our dry places. God, you know, we don't have to clean ourselves up and drag our, our carcasses to God. God finds us. God's faithful. He reaches out to us. You know, when, um, I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, I wasn't seeking God. God found me. He put people and circumstances in my path uh, to bring me to him. I wasn't searching for him. Uh, and I'm sure that's the case for most of us. So as Moses is tending his flock now, you know, he, he, like I said, he, he went from being a, a prince of Egypt to, uh, you know, tending flocks in the, in the desert. God calls him because God still has a plan and a purpose for him. And regardless of the fact that Moses messed up, God wasn't through with him, was he? You know, um, as the scripture says, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And sometimes I don't think we really grab a hold of that. That doesn't give us a license to sin. But what it does do is realize that the fact that when we do sin, Christ already paid the penalty for that sin. And we need to do, as, as I often quote, Proverbs 18, 17, a righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. You know, the devil would want us to stay down. He would want us to stay in that desert experience. But God says, no, I'm going to send a burning bush experience to you. And, you know, um, yeah, this is miraculous. There's a burning bush that doesn't get consumed by fire. But God provides the same thing for us that's just as miraculous. When he sends people, he sends uh, opportunity for us to come back to the Lord, doesn't he? That's just as much a miracle as the burning bush is. So, um, in typical fashion... He has this burning bush experience, right? And so you would think that if, we'll put it in the context of Oregon. Let's say we're walking in the woods and there's a burning pine tree experience. And God speaks to us. Um, you know, we would think, oh, okay, Lord, we would fall on our, our knees and do exactly what he says. Probably not. We'd probably be more like Moses in, in chapter 3 here where, you know, God calls him to certain things. God gives a promise and then calls him. If you, uh, in verse 7 in chapter 3, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrow, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a 
good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So there was this, so he's saying, you know, I have seen the oppression of my people and it's time for me to deal with it. And I want to use you, Moses. That's why I brought this burning bush. So as he goes on there and, and um, it continues on, in verse 10 it says, Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Right? You know, you got this burning bush that's not being consumed. There's a miracle in front of you. And God says, I'm going to use you to deliver my people out of the hand of Egypt. But listen to what happens in the very next verse, verse 11. It says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children uh, of Israel out of Egypt? So he's saying, here's the first excuse that he gives God. Uh, I'm not good enough, God. Well, let me give you a little clue. Um, You know, if God's calling you to do something, you're good enough. It's just that simple. You might not believe it, but if God has called you to do something, he will equip you and guide you and provide for you. You are good enough. Um, You know, if you are in the power of the Holy Spirit, you are good enough. You know, but like Moses, we do the same thing. We can come up with excuses, right? So he says, Lord, I'm not good enough. Uh, So God, God confirms, he says, Uh, So we said, I will certainly be with you. You know, it's like, yeah, you're right. You're not good enough, but I'll be with you, and I'm definitely good enough. Um, And it says, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on the mountain. And then here comes Moses with excuse number two. It's like, okay, well, I'm not good enough, but you're going to be with me. I know you are, so I better come up with another excuse. And he says in verse 12, or I'm sorry, in verse 13, it says, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? You know, uh, so here he is saying, Okay, Lord, you want me to, and let's say I go and I make it to that far, and I go to the, your children, the children of Israel, and they start asking me questions and I don't have the answers. That's what he's saying is, Lord, I don't have all the answers. Well, I can tell you what from somebody who sits behind this pulpit, neither do I. Um, And that's okay, you know, but God does. God's word does. Uh, And so God once again says, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. Uh, And thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am have sent you. You know, he's saying, tell them I am has sent you. They knew exactly what that meant. Tell them that Jehovah has sent you. Tell them that their God, the God of their fathers, has sent you. Right? And so as we continue on, and I'm kind of skipping through because we're already at uh, 8 o'clock here, it continues on in chapter 4 where Moses says, and then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. You know, Lord, okay, so I know you told me to tell them you sent me, but what if they don't believe me? Boo-hoo, does that, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You know, uh, a lot of times it's not a bad thing to think of worst case scenarios when you're dealing with, with worldly stuff or, you know, thinking, well, if I buy this property or I do this and this, what's the worst case scenario? But with God, that's not the way that we should serve him, right? Because if God, if it's God's will, it's never the worst case scenario. It's the only scenario that really matters. It's God's way. And it's, so the God said, you know, Moses said, wah, of course, this is the Kevin translation now. Moses said, "Wham! Well, what if they don't believe me? And God said in verse 2, um, So that the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. 
And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may be, believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So he's saying, okay, ye of little faith, um, They're not going to believe you. Okay, I'll give you a sign. Throw your rod down. It'll turn into a stink. You grab it back up, and they'll have to believe you, right? So Moses is like, man, Lord, you're going you're gonna to not let me get out of this, are you? You're just really, you're going to answer all of my excuses, and you're not going to allow me to do it, but I'm going to still try. So I'll give you excuse number four, Lord. And that's found in verse 10. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, am I not eloquent? Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Okay, Lord, I know you want me to go speak to the nation of Israel and the Pharaoh and all this, but I'm not a good speaker. Why would you choose me, Lord? Why would you want me? I can't speak. I'm slow of speech and tongue and whatever. I can't speak. I'm not eloquent right? And the funny thing about that is, is some of the most powerful people that I've ever heard speak, um, I was saved uh, in Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside. And, you know, it's a large church. There's about 18,000 people that attend there on a weekly basis. And um, the men's group that I was attending, there's was, there was like 2,500 men that would go each week And the leader of it, uh, he had like a fourth grade education, honestly. And he couldn't read half of the words here. But the Spirit spoke through him so profoundly um, that it didn't matter that he wasn't eloquent of speech or because he could live out God's word uh, like very few I ever seen. And it didn't matter that he just kind of like Moses here, you know, um, that gentleman could have used those same excuses uh, that Moses is trying to use. Well, I'm not eloquent. I'm slow with speech. So what? If God's calling you to do something, then he's going to He's going to make sure you're equipped to do it. It doesn't matter if you have a big vocabulary or or that you understand everything that's here. You know, um, I've seen people go out and witness new believers that have nothing but their own testimony of how God delivered them in in John 3.16. And it's more powerful than people who've been to, you know, um, Bible college. Just because the Spirit's moving in them. So we see excuse number four there, and then God is a lot more patient than me. Because in verse 13, we see excuse number five of Moses. And he says, but he said, oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Lord, I'm not qualified. Don't send me, please. Send by anybody else. I don't. Whoa, I almost fell off the stage. <laughs> Um, you know, he, he's, I'm going to do that one of these days. That's, I've done that so many times. Um, you know, but I digress. Uh, you know, he says, I'm not qualified, Lord. Don't send me. Why are you going to send me? But once again, Saint, if God's calling you, you are qualified. It, because it's not in your power, it's God's power. You know, I can remember when Linda and I was doing the homeless outreach ministry in Southern California, Warmth for the Weary, um, I can remember saying to my pastor at the time, it was like, I, I don't really understand why God's using me in a homeless ministry. I've never been homeless. I've never been any of this. He said, that's exactly why God's doing it, because you can't get the glory for it. Only God can. You know, and it's true. It's the same way here. If God has called us, God will guide and provide. It's not on our qualifications anyways. It's, it's through what God's doing in and through us. It's that simple. So, you know, as Moses is having this burning bush experience, you know, and there's this miracle happening, God's having this conversation with him. He's given all these excuses, you know, and it's easy for us to kind of shake our head and go, gosh, what's wrong with Moses? But we do the same thing on a daily basis, don't we? Or some of us on an hourly basis. Some of us even, uh, you know, on a a more basis than that. So, 
now that we've made fun enough of Moses and all of his excuses, you know, God did use Moses in a mighty way to deliver his people, didn't he? Eventually, Moses got it. Moses understood the power of the Lord, didn't he? And he understood that, uh, you know, that with God, all things are possible. Even if you are slow with speech, even if you are, uh, you know, you can't speak, if God's calling you to do it, you can accomplish it. I know that. The fact that I'm up here, if you would have known me as a kid, I was so shy, and well, still really am, it was so shy that I couldn't speak to people, I couldn't look them in the eyes, and God's called, you know, called me to speak in front of people. It's just mind-blowing. Uh, it really is, but that's the kind of God we serve. And so, in chapter 14, we see the, the Red Sea crossing, right? And so what we have here, and I'm not going to go very deep in it, but just um, because we don't have the time to, but, you know, what we see here is God once again faithfully delivering his people and providing a way when we can't see a way out. You know, God will part the seas in the problems and trials and tribulations of our lives, just as he did uh, for the Israelites parting the Red Sea so that they could pass through it. And those who were uh, pursuing them, you know, ended up dying and drowning. I love the Bible because, you know, one of the things that those who, who look for, um, you know, inconsistencies of the Bible... Um, I read an article where they're saying, well, the Red Sea really wasn't a sea. It was only a marsh, and it was just a couple of inches of water, and, and you know, this wind came along, and, yeah, I could easily kind of part the sea. And, and then the scholar of the article I was reading says, well, then the real miracle is how the whole Egyptian army could drown in two inches of water, <laughs> right? So either way, there's a miracle there that God performed. Either he split the, the literal sea and then brought it down upon the Egyptian army, or God drowned them in two inches of water. Either take your choice, it was still a miracle of God, and I love that. Um, I kind of hope it was the two inches of water. Personally, I can't wait to get to heaven to find out, because like I said, I just pray it was the two inches of water and not the sea. So, chapter 19. Once again, we see the... Uh, the children of God up to their old tricks, kind of like us, right? And, and so what we have here is we have God preparing uh, the nation of Israel to receive the Ten Commandments and the ordinances of God and stuff. And so in chapter 19, verse 5, it says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Do you think that covenant, that promise still applies to us today? Amen. Yes, it does. And so we see, you know, God's given them this special promise. Then God calls Moses up to receive the Ten Commandments and, and um, all of that, right? And so while he's up there, what happens? Uh, you know, the people get impatient. Well, Moses, you took too, so long, so we took all the gold earrings and jewelry and stuff, and we threw it in the fire, and it melted it, and unbeknownst to us, a golden calf pops out, right? It just so happened. And we were, you know, dancing around it and, and worshiping it. How easy is it for us, just like them, to take our eyes off of God and focus it on other things? You know, how easy is it for us to set up idols in our lives uh, to do just the same thing? You know, the U-turn guys are probably getting tired of me talking about idols because that we've been talking about idolatry for weeks now and how, you know, we commit idolatry when we put anything in our lives that takes the place or takes our focus off of God. But that's what we see here. And so in chapter 20 through 31, um, it's really God given in the laws and the ordinances of um, the law to, to Moses and to the Egyptians. And in, verse, in the chapter 32, like I said, the golden calf 
springs out of it. So at this point, we have you know the ordinances for the tabernacles, et cetera, et cetera, which obviously we're not going to get into. But it brings up you know where Christ is in all of this. So we have the law at this point um, and all the ordinances. But can the law save? Could the law save any of those people? No, right? And so uh, it's, Jesus addresses it in the New Testament. He says, you know, um, the law was never intended for your salvation. What the law was to do is it was supposed to be a schoolmaster to point you to the one who could Save the one who was capable of that, right? And we, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, it says, uh, Jesus said, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is fulfilled. You know, what's this telling us? This is telling us a couple of things. It's telling us about God's Word. It's telling us about the quality of God's Word. And that's simply this. It says, you know, the law and the prophets. God's Word is everlasting. God's Word doesn't change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God doesn't change. He's unchangeable. He's the same as He was in eternity past as He will be in eternity uh, in the future, right? That's the first thing. Um, the word was written uh, with intent. It was written so it would be fulfilled. It was written so that we could understand, especially us New Testament saints, can see the, the, the prophecies, right? And the fulfillment of them in Christ. We see it, we see it all throughout Exodus here. And lastly, the word is faithful and trustworthy. Everything about it is true. There is nothing that God has said that has not come to pass. You know, God's word is 100% accurate. If it wasn't, then we wouldn't be serving the right God. Amen? So as we, as we see this, the law that was given here in Exodus was never meant to uh, save us. It was just meant to point us towards the Savior. You know, and we're going to... In this, in, in Galatians, if you, um, chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. You know, thank God that Jesus fulfilled the law. Thank God that we have a Savior that fulfilled all that. Because I guarantee of all the over 600 ordinances and laws of the Old Testament, we couldn't have even came close. We can't even fulfill the 10 big ones, the 10 commandments. Each and every person here has broken them. And if we've broken the 10 commandments, then we are required to pay the penalty for it, which is spiritual death, isn't it? But God. But Jesus paid the, debt, paid the price for it. He fulfilled the penalty of the law so that we could have the hope in the, uh, of knowing that we can spend eternity with Him if we come to Him by faith. It's all we have to do. It's by God's grace. It's not by being able to um, follow the law because none of us, we would all fall short. We all have fallen short. We are justified through a free gift of God's grace that uh, when he paid the penalty for our debt on the cross. And it's only through accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, coming to him by faith, that we can have the penalty of the law erased in our lives. You know, God is good, as it says in 
Galatians 2.16, and I'm going to finish with this. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have, been, have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You know, if you've been trying to do this on your own, if you've been trying to clean yourself up, if you've been trying to be a good person, I'll give you a clue. You, fall, you have fallen miserably short. There's only one way to be justified, and that's through the, the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then let today be your day of, sal uh, of salvation, because we don't know how long we have. We don't know. Uh, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, either here in the sanctuary or online, let tonight be the night that you too can call yourself a children of God. You know, and, and, and have all those promises that we've talked about tonight applied to you. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, you can come up and, and one of the pastors will be up here to pray with you. Or if you're online, just a simple prayer of asking God to forgive you of your sins and, and to uh, come to him by faith. And then if you'd like to know more, call the church office or call one of us and we'll be glad to talk to you. So with that being said, let's go before the Lord in prayer and, and uh, close. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for your deliverance. Uh, just as it was chronicled here in Exodus, Lord, uh, you know, we could just as easily chronicle uh, the Exodus in our own life from sin into, uh, from darkness and into light, Lord. We thankful, we're so thankful for your faithfulness to deliver us too, Lord. God, we thank you for your uh, miracle working power, uh, as you displayed it in many of the stories throughout the book of Exodus, you're still displaying it in many stories here in the sanctuary and those listening online, Lord. So God, we thank you for who you are and all that you've done. So Lord, we just uh, give you the rest of this evening. Lord, I pray that you'd give those who traveled here traveling mercies on the way home. Once again, we lift up Pastor Steve and Carol. Just ask for your... Uh, you'd perform a miracle on their bodies and on their electricity and water, Lord. So God, uh, we just thank you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Like I said, we'll be up here for prayer if anybody needs prayer. or um, We'll be up here.